and the report is that apparently there were a couple of people who are um in the upper in the upper uh, levels of uh ukrainian uh intelligence the what the report we're getting is they were involved in some kind of an assassination plot or attempt of uh when it comes to um uh, Vladimir Zelensky and they failed. Could it be true? Yes. Could it be, you know, bull crap? And maybe they, the, you know, they're setting the table to rub him out. I don't know. I do think it has to do with the fact that here we're going getting close to May 21 and his legitimacy as a uh, U.S. puppet president will soon be coming into question. Your thoughts on the reported, I'm just going to call it a reported um, assassination. I mean, it could very well be true. It could very well be true. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying I keep an open mind on this. I guess we can look at it either way. But um, your thoughts on the reported assassination attempt on uh, on our boy Zelensky? Well, first of all, the report comes from Zelensky's office himself. Um, so, you know, it's not a rumor coming from, you know, a, the cousin of a cook, of a driver, of a, you know, railroad worker who heard it from a grandmother of a you know, this is coming from the presidential office itself. So um, it there's a reason why it's coming out. We, we need to explain that, uh, first of all. Um, now let's talk about the, the details. I mean, I, I first of all, I would, I would start off by saying that I don't believe that Russia would be involved in this kind of crude attempt. Um, as we speak, uh, Zelensky- if, I, if I might just If I might just say this, if Russia wanted him dead, it wouldn't be an attempt. That's the first thing. They wouldn't attempt if they wanted him dead. But go ahead, Scott. You know, if they if they wanted to take him out, they would take him out. But Russia is a nation that um, understands that once you start getting in the business of um, assassinating heads of state, um, it's a two way street, and you know you don't want to encourage uh, things of that nature. Um, the other thing is that Zelensky is one of Russia's best allies right now. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't pick a a, a better president for Ukraine uh, than Zelensky when it comes to the Russian perspective. Um, you know, he is a man who is increasingly alienated with his own public, his own military. Um, he's alienated with his Western supporters. Um, why would you ever want to remove this guy and re have him replaced by an unknown? Um, somebody who might get along better with the uh, allies, uh, somebody who might be supported by the public, willing, you know, who can motivate the public to continue the war, et cetera. All of the mistakes that Ukraine has made, and there have been many since this conflict started and even before this conflict started, um, land on the desk of Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, he is the ultimate fall guy. And, um, you know, from the Russian perspective, I... I just let this gift keep on giving for as long as it can. Russia's already made it clear that um, they're not going to negotiate with him. He's been put on, you know, a, a wanted list. Um, that's, uh, you know, that 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 decision to transform him from um, somebody Russia would be willing to talk to to somebody Russia won't be willing to talk to coincides with the decision by the Russians to transition from what they were calling the active defense phase into the offensive phase. So Russia's on the offensive. Words have meaning when you're uh, when you're Russians and the offensive means that Russia is now going to radically transform the battlefield, that they are um, not satisfied with active static defense, that the positional warfare is no longer uh, what their objective is, that the meat grinder, that they, uh, the war of attrition uh, that they've been undertaking now has moved into a different phase where Rather than being passive and letting the Ukrainians come to them, the Russians are going to be seeking out the Ukrainians and killing them in very large numbers. Um, and when you make that decision, that means now territorial acquisition is on the on the table. If you're going to negotiate with the Ukrainians, um, the ideal time to negotiate is when you can offer the Ukrainians something such as, hey, we're not going to be capturing Odessa, Kharkov, Nikolai, Nepopetrovsk. Uh, if you negotiate now, you might get to keep them. Um, now Russia's gone into the offensive phase. They put Zelensky, Poroshenko, Yermak, Danilov, and others, all these you know, top Ukrainian officials who would logically be part of 
any negotiated settlement and they put them on a wanted list, which means these are criminals. You don't negotiate with criminals. So negotiations are off the table. Positional warfare is off the table. Russia's on the offense. Um, you know, Zelensky, keep him in power. Uh, don't actively try to kill him. Now, what happens? I mean, if if Mother Nature takes its course and uh, there's a Ukrainian effort to assess it, that's just good for the Russians because they're not involved. Uh, it creates chaos uh, and uncertainty amongst the Ukrainian ranks and amongst the their their allies. But you know, no Russian fingerprints on it. So if this was an assassination attempt, um, then I would believe that it's a homegrown assassination attempt, and it's part and parcel of a growing level of resentment that exists inside. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, security services and military services about the incompetence of Volodymyr Zelensky and the you know the damage that has been suffered by Ukraine as a result of this incompetence. But there's also a possibility that this could just be a manufactured event put forward by Zelensky uh, in an effort to have people rally around him. This is a period of time where people Zelensky has very few allies. And the ones he have, they're just jumping ship because he is literally, <laughs> he isn't the Titanic right after it hit the iceberg where people can fool themselves into thinking there's enough buoyancy that this baby's going to stay afloat. This is the Titanic as it's kill up, killing over people jumping off. This is the final scenes of the movie Titanic uh, where, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio is holding on for dear life, waiting to, to drop, you know, are you with me? And, um, that's it. That's where Zelensky is right now. And he, he needs, um, you know, people to stay with him, to help drag him onto a life raft, to help him not drown in the ocean. Um, and so he's trying to make himself um, sympathetic to, to, a, to an audience and say, look, they're trying to kill me and blame it on the Russians and, uh, and all this. But if I were to rate this of the three things we have, uh, Russia's, Russia did it, uh, in-house Ukraine or manufactured story to gain sympathy and I were briefing uh, my you know my leadership um, with the information I currently have because understand that <laughs> we don't know much except what's coming out of Zelensky's office I would rate the probability number one this is a manufactured event designed to um, get sympathy for Zelensky number two it's an in-house event Ukrainian only and number three um, is that uh, Russia Russia is behind this yeah, I, I agree with you. If you could speak to um, one of the things you were talking about, and that was the uh, what I see is the uh, that we talked about. It was a matter of time. Uh, the collapse of support for this war within Ukraine. They've been manufacturing support in Ukraine. You know, I, I, my understanding is they only had they had like five or six TV channels and every one of them ran like the same propaganda 24 hours a day. You know, it was like the war is great. We're winning. The Russians are losing. Keep supporting it. We're the good guys all day long. And that um, people are starting to drop off and that they're unhappy with the latest mobilization law. They're unhappy with the way everything's going and that losing the people is, you know, people don't want to come back and fight. They're in other parts of the uh, EU, you know, protesting. Other countries are saying, yeah, we're not going to send them back to a certain death. What about the under underlying support for the war? How's that going? Let me tell you how a country looks like when the people support it. Just look north to Russia. Look at today's Victory Day. They had a massive parade. Um, there's people that say that this is propaganda. That's just, you know, Putin out there doing propaganda. No, guys, I was there last year. It's as real as it gets. The, uh, the patriotism in Russia was real last year. It's even more real this year. The, uh, the concept of uh, recognizing their heroes, uh, the number of volunteers, 30 to 40,000 a month volunteering to go to the war. And this is a sustainable number. This isn't like the United States after 9-11 where everybody volunteered in September and October, but it started petering off in November, December. And, uh, and then people started waking up. Wait a minute, I'm not going to Afghanistan. You're sending me to Iraq. Iraq had nothing to do with Pat Tillerson, uh, case in point. Um, you know, the, the Arizona Cardinal um, uh, safety who left a million dollar job in the NFL to go volunteer to serve his country because of 9-11 only to find himself in Iraq in a, you know, in a war that he didn't want to fight. Uh, the Russians believe in this war. Uh, they believe in Russia. Um, they love their country. Uh, they're willing to make, you have people willing to go to a doctor 
to get surgery at their own expense to overcome a medical condition that prevents them from being accepted into the military. <laughs> and they're 40 years old. So you're a 40 year old man with a wife, kids, job, career, and you're going to put all that on the side, spend your own money to get a get an operation so that you can qualify to serve in an army at war on the front lines. Uh, this is about patriotism, about love of country. Um, you have all the millions of Russians that left uh, uh, when the special military operations started. They're all phoning home. And they're all, Please let me back. Let me back. They don't like us. I'm Russian and they don't like me. Well, welcome to the reality, man. You thought they were going to love you. Uh, you believed in this Navalny baloney. Um, you know, and now they're coming back. And, you know, there's no requirement when they come back. But many of them out of feeling guilt um, are joining the military as a way of uh, repenting for their for their for their sins. Uh, Vladimir Putin has made it clear that um, it's the heroes of this conflict that will be um, running Russia in the future. So Russia's future is connected to patriotic linkage to this war. Now we go to Ukraine. Um, they may have had patriotic people. They may have had 500,000 of them, but they're all dead. They've been killed. Um, and they've been killed in a way that um, doesn't bring glory for the country. If people are questioning, you know, why are they dying? For what reason? When you hear your ostensible allies in the West speaking of fighting to the last Ukrainian and then acknowledging that once that last Ukrainian dies, they're going to run away from this problem, that uh, no NATO boots on the ground. Uh, even the NATO member, I mean, you had France, you know, Macron beating his chest about how he's going to send troops, send troops, send troops, send troops, send troops. And suddenly his ambassador gets summoned to the foreign ministry where he's read the riot act. I would love to know what he was told, but I think it's something like this. If you send troops to Ukraine, we will kill the troops. If you respond to that, we will attack you in your country. And if you respond to that, we will nuke you and you won't exist. The decisions have already been made. There's no debating here. Have a good day. Get the hell out of here. And did the same thing to the UK guy who, you know, Cameron is running around. We're going to let the storm shadow attack targets in the depth of Russia, strategic targets. I think the Russians called him and said, if that happens, we blame you, we we'll bomb you, we attack you in England, anywhere else. And if you respond, we nuke you, you disappear. Have a good day. Get the hell out of my office. Uh, this is where we're at right now. Um, the Ukrainians, you know, the men, the millions fled, millions fled. Um, but unlike the Russians who fled, they're not phoning home saying, I'm coming home to volunteer, to serve in the military. They're saying, keep me the hell out. I don't want anywhere near this front line. The Ukrainian army right now is in a position where they're out of volunteers. Nobody's volunteering. They have to pass mobilization laws and people are being conscripted unwillingly. Some unwillingly go because it's the law. Many others are beat over the head, thrown into a van, uh, taken to train. How do you expect them to perform on the front line? I mean, they had one video where a guy was shouting, I have children at home. I have children at home. And they were still trying to stuff him in the van. But fortunately, some people intervened and he got leave. But what would happen if he didn't leave the van? They take him to training and he has children at home. But they're, they you think he's focused on training? You think he gives a damn about the training? And then they put him in the front line. They put him in a car. They kick him out at the front line and say, your position's 500 yards that way. And there's artillery shells falling down. You think he's going to sit there and, and, and say, yep, let me crawl on my belly to get that front line, getting hunkered in, take a look, um, you know, my left and right. Uh, do I got my javelin? Do I have my grenades laid out? Uh, if the artillery comes in, am I ready? Have I prepared my position? Or he's going to say, how the hell do I get out of here back to my children who I left at home? Um, Ukraine is a fundamentally broken country. Um, the Azov uh, battalion regiment turned into the third assault brigade. They don't want to fight anymore because they're tired. They've been the fire brigade, you know, because as the rest of the Ukrainian military collapses, as we've been talking about, they're the ones sent in to plug the hole. And they've been plugging the hole. They were plugging the hole in Bakhmut. They were plugged the hole once in Advievka. And then they were told to go to Advievka again. And they went, nope, we're not doing that. And then they were told to plug the hole near Chasov Yar. Nope, we're not doing that because plugging the hole means dying in place because there are no forces to rotate us out. We'll go in there and then you're going to tell us to stay there and we're just going to die. These fab 500s, fab 1500s, these um, guided bombs are going to come in and just blow us to pieces. Uh, there's no air defense. There's no artillery to come in and hold them off. We're just going to die. We don't want to die. 
the 67th Brigade, mechanized or armored brigade, mechanized brigade. These were the right sector guys. Uh, they 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 brought all these right sector Nazi thugs, brought them together, formed them into a unit. They've run off the battlefield, saying we're not willing to die for this anymore. Uh, the 25th Air Mobile, um, a neo-Nazi formation, people who sing uh, Bandera songs when they wake up in the morning. Um, they have been almost disbanded because they refuse to fight anymore. These are the elite units of Ukraine. The 47th was sent in. They fought. They're dead. Um, the best units Ukraine have have either died on the battlefield or have refused to fight. Uh, as we speak, the, 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 the front is just collapsing. If the Russians take Chasov Yard, not if, when the Russians take Chasov Yard, it's a small town, that, but it occupies a strategic height. When you look at the map, it's the high point. And from Chasov Yard, the terrain goes down and goes off to uh, Kramatorsk and other uh, Slavyansk. Um, and the Russians will have dominance over here. The Ukrainians won't be able to do anything. And so it's inevitable then at that point in time, the Russians break out. That's why they're moving 100,000 troops in here, another 80,000 troops there, another 120,000 troops there, troops that haven't been committed to battle, freshly trained, freshly equipped, um, led by leadership that's combat hardened. Uh, you know, that's the reality. So the Ukrainians, it's a total mismatch right now, a total mismatch. This is why in the West, you know, you, you have them saying, not, not, what do we do if the Ukrainian army collapses? It's what do we do when the Ukrainian army collapses and the Russians break through their defensive lines? What's our strategy? And this is where you have France, Macron making the ridiculous statements about if that happens, we will send French troops in to plug the hole. And the Russians are going, no, you won't. You'll, we'll, we'll just kill you. you know, there's, there, there's rumors that they sent 100 sheep-dipped French foreign legionnaires in as sort of the advanced element of uh, up to 1500 uh, Frenchmen that would, again, sheep dip means that uh, you're in the French army, but they dip you to make you look like you're a uh, Ukrainian, and but you're still getting paid by the French army. You're under French command. You're French. They sent 100 in. I think the first day, seven of them died. Many others were wounded, and I think they've been dying ever since. And uh, the French are outraged. How dare you target a Frenchman? And the Russians are like, we don't care. We'll kill them all. Uh, bring them on. And then we nuke you. Um, it, it, this, this is a, a, a situation on the battlefield that's unsustainable for, for Ukraine. Um, there's no hope. And again, the man that everybody's blaming is Volodymyr Zelensky. So now we come back to the beginning. Why would Russia? Because imagine what happens if you remove Zelensky and you get a charismatic person who's competent. Everything you just struggle to achieve has the potential of being at least momentarily reversed because suddenly those units that don't want to fight say, I'll fight for him. And now they come into the line and now you have to do, you know, go back to a more difficult fight. Russia's fought very hard to get to this position where they are right now. And this is time for the decisive blow. The last thing they want to do is allow the Ukrainians to alter the algorithm and, um, and, and, and extend this fight. It doesn't change the outcome, but it changes the cost and it changes the timeline. Um, yeah, the Iranians have a saying, thank God for making my enemies fools, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, if Zelensky's your adversary, why? You, I'm with you. This guy's a disaster. You wouldn't want them to get a, a makeover of, the, of this thing. Let me ask you this. Kharkov, Odessa. I think Kharkov is done. That's going to be bad. We see the direction that that's going. Odessa. There's all of this talk about um, will the Russians take Odessa? Will NATO try to stop them? Will they put troops in there? Blah, blah, blah. It is my opinion, throw it to you, the Russians have made a decision. This is our border. We're protecting our border. and We're going to do everything we can. They have launched attack after attack on the Russians from um, Odessa. If I were the military mind or the political mind behind this, I would say we ain't coming back to this again. We're not redoing this in five years. We're not going to deal with these people. We will fight now. If they want to fight for Odessa, they ain't going to fight for Odessa in five years. They're going to have to fight for it now. We're taking Odessa. We're taking everything that we need. One time we played with these guys. We had Istanbul, Istanbul agreements, Minsk agreements, this agreement, that agreement. Now we got to fight. We'll finish this fight once and for all. If I were the Russians, I'd take everything I wanted, and that would include Odessa. You've hit me from Odessa and threatened me from Odessa. That is the way I see it. I'm just saying, I don't know what the Russians are going to do. That is what I would do. Your thoughts on the Russians. Will they take Odessa? Will they negotiate for it? What happens with Odessa? 
Let's uh, let's start with this. I think the the first thing that's going to fall will be Kharkov, and probably uh, Chernyaev and Sumy. Um, the Russians are going to retake the territories that they took early on in the uh, special military operation. Um, they have one army group already formed up. They have another one uh, coming in, and they have to do this. And the reason why is that the Ukrainians have been launching attacks against Bryansk and Kursk from the territories near Kharkov. And so Russia has said that one of their priorities is to create um, you know, buffer zones to ensure that the Ukrainians can't attack Russian soil. And so I, I think that that decision is being made. Um, whether or not they choose to fight urban warfare against uh, Kharkov or just surround it and make it surrender, um, you know, I, my, my guess is they're just going to surround it and then, um, and then make it surrender. Um, you know, the, you know, there's no reason to, you know, you surround it and then basically it's at your mercy. You just, uh, use your intelligence to find out where the military units are and you destroy them piecemeal. You encourage the population to rise up and, um, you know, you take the city without having to go street to street fighting, but they, they can surround it. And I think they can push in and take, uh, Sumy, Chernyaev and the rest of Kharkov. Um, that creates the buffer zone that keeps the Ukrainians away from the Russian border. And this is politically very important for, um, for Vladimir Putin. It's a promise he's made to the Russian people. But here's from a military standpoint why it's important. Because when Russia does that, uh, it's going to strike decisively. And uh, the Ukrainians will have to divert all of their reserves there in, in a losing cause because they'll be interdicted on the way up, etc. But by coming in there, Russia now forces Ukraine to commit. And then Russia does, I believe, make the move on Nikolaev and, um, and Odessa. There's a reason why they formed the Dnieper River Flotilla. They don't control the Dnieper River right now, but they are going to. And when they, when they do control it, they're going to need to maintain control because they're going to have to put bridges across uh, so that they, they can sustain you know, offensive operations. The Dnieper uh, River flotilla, flotilla is going to control the river on both banks, enabling Russia to get that bridgehead over in the Zaporizhia area. Because remember, they are going to recapture Zaporizhia. They get to the Dnieper River. They'll cross. They'll move on, pivot south, take Nikolaev, and now they'll be positioned on Odessa. Now, will they go after Odessa? Um, again, the Russians' words are important. And... Um, actions are important. Uh, the Russians don't do anything that has no meaning, meaning <laughs> if they're going to do something, there's a reason. I've worked with them long enough to know that every little thing has a purpose. They, in the Victory Day Parade today, they had a contingent of um, combat veterans from the special military operation that were brought in to march as a, as a unit, as a collective. And with them, they carried and this is the important part, the battle standards of the Soviet units that captured Kherson, Zaporizhia, Mikolaev, Odessa, Odessa, Odessa. Okay, I mean, <laughs> the Russians just aren't the kind of people just to do something like that and say, oh, well, we didn't mean it. I think once the Ukrainians pivot up, the Russians are sitting on another 120, 200,000 troops. This is the beauty of having 30 to 40 guys volunteer every month for uh, combat. In addition to, you know, your normal con your, your, your normal um, contracts, because a lot of, you know, a lot of people get conscripted. Um, there's two conscription phases per year. Now conscripts aren't supposed to be deployed in combat outside of Russia. Well, yeah. Zaporizhia, Kherson, and the Donbass are now part of Russia. Um, but they aren't necessarily put on the front lines, but they are brought in closer. And so many contract uh, conscripts say, I'll, I'll just sign a contract. And so they they join, they sign a contract, and now they become contract soldiers. Um, you know, between these three recruitment things, the Russians have, they're just overwhelmed with manpower um, at a time when they're suffering the lowest casualties ever. Never believe anything you read in the West and the British. The Russians are suffering a thousand a day. That's just mirror imaging what the Ukrainians are, are suffering. That's what British intelligence does. They make stuff up. Um, they they ref, you know deflect or reflect um, what's happening to Ukraine onto Russia for propaganda purposes. Russia is suffering. And you know how one of the reasons why you can believe this? Because an anti-Russian um, media group that is not pro-Russian at all who monitors these casualties 
Uh, first of all, the number of dead they've come up with is about what I've come up with. I mean, it's not an official Russian number. Uh, we don't know. But they're saying 54,000 Russians have died since uh, the start of this. And that's about right. That doesn't include um, others. I, I have the number closer to 80, but that's factoring in, um, you know, uh, volunteer units, uh, reserve units, um, units that aren't normally Wagner, uh, that wouldn't normally be calculated into these these factors. When you add all those, you get around 80,000 dead. Um, the spike was during the Battle of Bakhmut, um, highest level of casualties. Uh, they've dropped now. And, but the thing is, when you drop, if you superimpose Ukrainian casualties, Ukrainians now are suffering the greatest casualties uh, that they have since the war started. And, um, you know, that's that's where we're at. So the Russians have the advantage now of of just being they have not only manpower available, but equipment. Uh, their defense industry has double, tripled their output. Uh, they're producing, you know, more tanks a month than NATO can produce in a year. <laughs> I'll say that one more time. More tanks a month than NATO can produce in a year. And they can increase those number of tank productions. Um, just by hitting the accelerator a little bit more. So these units aren't just, you know, mobs of, you know, of, of poorly trained infantrymen. This isn't the Battle of Stalingrad where, you know, they don't give you a gun. They tell you to run forward and pick up a gun from the first guy that gets who has a gun who gets killed and just keep the attack going. No, these are well-trained, well-motivated, well-equipped troops, well-led. Um, and I think that once they commit to the Kharkov, Sumy, Chernev battle and the Ukrainians have to pivot their last remaining reserves, and they're not even reserves because you're pulling them from the front line elsewhere. Um, they'll make the push on Odessa. And the reason why I believe this is Putin has said Odessa is a Russian city. Um, everybody I've talked to talks about Odessa being a Russian city. And the combat guys just paraded with the war, the, the war banner of Odessa. Um, so that just tells me that it's it's going to happen. So I agree, with, but I think it's going to be the the final um, offensive push. The first thing is to secure the border area um, opposite of Belgorod and Kursk, um, because you know that is a that is a priority uh, for for Russia. P plus, I think in doing that, as I said, you're going to suck all the available Ukrainian reserves into that front, and then it's a cakewalk. And and Russia just put France on notice that um, if you want to put French troops there, we'll kill them. Uh, but then we'll also attack you. And if you want to go nuclear, that's in the cards too. Well, I, and here's the other thing I think. If I want to take Odessa, you know, it's a beautiful city. It's a beloved historical city. And, you know, the Russians uh, a real concern for history and culture and things of that nature. They don't want to, you know, get in a fight and blow up Odessa. I My move would be I'm going to knock the crap out of you everywhere else so that the guys left in Odessa are going to say, we've lost this war. You know what I mean? The guys are sitting in Odessa are going to look around and say, we've, we've lost the Donbass. We've lost everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. That we're sitting here and what are we defending? You know, I want them to sit there with their rifles and say, oh, my gosh, they took Kharkov. They took Nikolai. They took that. They took that. Oh, my gosh. They got they got everything. And we're sitting here and the Russians are saying, guys, you need to surrender. You, you're cut off. You're surrounded. Everything else is smashed to pieces. What do you have left? What are you fighting for? You're just fighting. That's the position. If i am got this, I want to put myself in the position or I want to put the soldiers in the position there where, yeah, they can fight to the death if they choose. But they're not fighting to they can't argue we're fighting to protect Ukraine or win that at that point, they're just fighting to the death if they choose to do it. That a lot of those soldiers are going to say the war is lost. What are we doing? Not that they won't fight, but I think that would be my strategy. And I kind of think that's is that what you're saying when you say they're going to save it for left for last something similar? Yeah. And plus, I, you know, like Kharkov, um, I don't think the Russians again, <laughs> here I am. Um, thousands of miles away in America. I'm not a Russian and I don't talk to show you on uh, any basis. <laughs> you know, I wish I had the red phone, but I don't. Um, so guys take this with the grain of salt Certainly. that it deserves. Um, but I don't think the Russians are looking to um, engage in house to house fighting in Kharkov. It would be bloody. It would be significant casualties. Um, the Russians have a history. Uh, you know, they look back, you know, to the, 
end game of World War II, you know, as they're driving through, um, you know, what what became you know, Western Poland, uh, at that time East Prussia, and moving in through Germany towards Berlin, there were any number of um, fortress cities that um, the troops were told to stand in place. The Russians simply surrounded them and then waited them out. Um, if you look at the history of the liberation of Auschwitz, uh, the unit that actually liberated Auschwitz had been involved in, um, you know, the siege of one of these fortress cities, and that siege had been lifted the day because the, the Germans there finally said, "We're surrendering," and they surrendered, and then these guys moved on. Um, but the the Russians have enough troops right now where they can encircle a city and just play place it under siege, and um, the Ukrainian forces there. You know, both in, in Kharkov and in Odessa, there are pro-Russian insurgent groups, partisans. Um, and so this will not be an easy existence for them. They will have no resupply, and eventually they will have no choice but to surrender. And I believe that they will surrender, just like the German troops did. The other option that can happen in Odessa is um, you blockade from the land, but then you allow the Russians to pull either a, um, you know, Taman Peninsula scenario, uh, uh, a Sevastopol scenario, or a Konigsberg scenario, meaning that as the Russians blocked off all land retreat and pushed, they took advantage of being on a, on, on a port and evacuated on ships. And so you could see a lot of Ukrainians uh, being pulled out and sent to Romania, for instance, where they would be interned, maybe they could be brought back into the battle that way. But um, and I think the Russians would allow that to happen because again, you know, Sun Tzu, um, if, rather than surrounding your enemy, leave them an opening to retreat because then rather than being confronted with the only option of fighting and dying, they'll see that I can possibly survive. Human instinct takes over and they leave. So I think with Odessa, the Russians will be uh, encouraging the Ukrainians to leave by sea as opposed to defend the city until the last man on the last block of the last, you know, last house of the last block. Um, Odessa has too much history. Uh, the Russians love the city too much. I don't believe they're, um, you know, they would be looking forward to um, destroying it in house to house fighting. And again, when the Ukrainian troops that are defending it realize that a, um, they're not going to win, there's no relief column coming their way. B the population is hostile. So they're being attacked from inside and from the outside and see, oh, we've been given a way out of here. Um, and then D, when the Ukrainian high command says, do we want, really want to have 40,000 guys in Odessa uh, hold up there uh, when the Russians are knocking at Kiev? Um, maybe we need to get those 40,000 out up to Kiev and, and see what we can preserve there. So, um, you know, I, th these are the options that I see. I don't see Russia doing... Uh, urban fighting. I see Russia surrounding, drawing upon the lessons of World War II. And, um, you know, and, and the Ukrainians, humans are humans. And um, we, we, we know how people behave in, um, in environments. You know, Mariupol was a, a shock to the Ukrainians. They uh, thought they could hold out, defend, you know, launch an attack. And Mariupol taught them they can't. Bakhmut taught them the, the the futility of uh, city to city fighting, as did Adievka, as is all the other battles that they fight. Um, there, there's not a single scenario that has Ukrainians winning, and so um, most people don't want to commit suicide, especially in support of a losing cause. Um, Zelensky is not, you know, Adolf Hitler, uh, meaning that uh, there isn't a fanatical core of uh, of Ukrainians that are totally dedicated to Zelensky as you know, as, as a, as a human God, um, you know, Hitler, for whatever reason, a lot of Germans were willing, who believed in him and were willing to die for him right up until the very end. I don't think there's a lot of Ukrainians willing to die for Zelensky right now. Um, I, there is some breaking news. We can get your thoughts on it. Uh, Iran to change nuclear doctrine. If Israel threatens its existence, Iran announced that it would change its nuclear doctrine. Should Israel threatens its existence, a senior advisor to the Supreme leader said on Thursday, according to Reuters, um, Iran has consistently re reiterated that it does not intend to build a nuclear bomb. Um, but should Iran's existence be threatened, there will be no choice 
but to change our military doctrine. Also, Iran has the necessary capabilities to develop a nuclear bomb and advance nuclear weapons. Uh, and so bottom line is, this is a, you know, we've talked about this before, but this is a pretty much an official announcement by Iran from, you know, and now this comes from the, uh, Kamal Kazar. So we've got a name behind it. One of the top officials, look, guys, if you threaten us with nukes, we'll get a nuke and nuke you. We it was rumored and discussed and stuff like that. And it came from somebody at the, uh, the uh, what is it there, whatever guard, the IRGC, the uh, uh, Republican Guard, whatever it's called. But now the government's come out and said it. What are your thoughts on that, Scott? Well, this is uh, this is serious, um, you know, because in the past, uh, you know, when 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 this, you know, this similar statement was made right after the uh, Iranian retaliation. Um, and, but at that time, the, um, the, the source was from a, a Telegram account that turned out to be a fake account. And so you had to dismiss the source. Um, now it's coming from you know, the student news agency, which is literally an arm of the Iranian um, government, and it's quoting an Iranian government official linked to Supreme Leader Khamenei. Now, unless the Iranians come out and immediately denounce this, you have to take this seriously. This means that there is a major rethink of what Islam is in Iran. Um, because there were fatwas uh, that were issued that uh, declared uh, nuclear weapons to be haram, forbidden. Um, and this would require reversal, which means then that the that you don't do this superficially. So there it has there's had to have been a meeting in Qom or in Tehran amongst the um, religious uh, leaders, uh, the, the Marja or... Um, you know, whatever the assembly of, uh, of, of, of Ayatollahs is, the, where they had to look to the Quran. They had to look to the teachings of Muhammad. They had to look to Hadith um, and find, um, you know, religious reasoning that would allow a reversal off of a fatwa. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is that this isn't superficial then. Um, we shouldn't be dismissive of this. This means, because in order to make this shift, this means, because I, I have to tell you, the, uh, I mean, I'll, I quote the, uh, I could have quoted, but I, here it is. The, uh, this is from the Iranian president, um, where he says straight up that uh, there is no potential in the military dimensions of nuclear weapons. There is no potential in the military dimension of nuclear weapons. Iran doesn't believe in it. It is forbidden by fatwa. It is a sacred command. We would never pursue nuclear weapons. Um, that's a direct quote from the president of Iran, direct quote. And, um, and the other reason why you have to take this seriously is that, you know, um, Ali Khamenei is an old man who has some health issues and he's knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. And, um, at some point in time, he's not going to be here. And the assembly of experts is going to have to pick the next Supreme leader. And, uh, one of the men who has the inside track on that is the current president, Ibrahim Raisi, who is himself a very um, uh, well-regarded Islamic scholar, um, a religious figure in his own right. So, and he, this is him saying it. <laughs> and, and so to make this shift, it's a fundamental shift that has to be done properly in accordance with Islam. Because otherwise, you you are a Islamic republic that um, you're you're very the, the very 
reason you exist is because you're promoting Islamic ideals. Um, and you've already said, in accordance with all Islam, nuclear weapons are forbidden. And now they're not? <laughs> How do you square that one? And But, you know, the other thing, interesting thing about the uh, Shia faith as it's practiced by Iran is that it is a um, a living religion. And what it means by that is, for instance, as you become, if you train to become a Grand Ayatollah in 1860, um, and you were trying to form a marja, uh, a gathering, a following, you would publish uh, basically uh, your interpretation of Islam based upon a current um, social um, you know, environment. And then people would read that and decide whether or not they supported you. There's a, is, there is a democratic aspect to this. People would read it and say, I don't, support, I don't believe in this crap. And then they, they wouldn't come to your marja and you are a failed Ayatollah. <laughs> And if, but if you publish it and people say, yeah, I agree, and they come, now they're going to listen to you as a learned individual, et cetera. Um, so if you, you, whatever they were defending in 1860, I guarantee you in 1990, they were defending something different. And in 2020, they were defending something different because society changes. There's societal challenges now to the people um, that you know, faith has to address. Uh, you have to deal with television, radio, internet. These are things that, that didn't weren't considered right. back in the day. So now, so we know that Islam is a living religion for them. That they that you have new Islamic leadership coming out publishing um, their interpretation based upon forty years of study. It's not superficial, and and then they say, you know, how do we deal with the internet? What? How do we deal with? Um, you know, with, with radio and television and things of that nature. And so now you are confronted with a new reality of the age, which is imminent nuclear destruction at the hands of an openly hostile nation. What does Islam say about that? Because Islam does say, you know, does say that the, these weapons, indiscriminate killing of women and children and all this is haram, forbidden. That's why nuclear weapons aren't supported because it's not that they kill, it's that they kill indiscriminately. They kill the innocents that you're and you're not allowed to do this under the interpretation that they put forward. Now what you're saying is uh, I imagine that they had religious scholars look at this and say, um, you know, yes, but <laughs> you know, it's one of those right, things. exactly. Yeah. But Muhammad said, da 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 da, when confronted with this, that, and the other thing, you may make an exception to that it's more important to preserve the is you know the, the the Islamic state than it is to you know do this that and the other thing. I don't know. I wasn't sitting in in Qom when they went through all this, but I can imagine that like any religion, you can attack it from different angles. And hell, we got Christians, you know, telling us Jesus who said turn the other cheek, really, and who said don't cut off the ear. I'm healing the ear of the man that you draw through. That Jesus is actually saying go forth and kill in my name. Amen. Praise be the Lord. Uh, you know, so we, we have religious leaders who can twist religion any of the way. The one, I'm not accusing the Iranians of twisting anything. I'm just saying that we have to take this statement seriously. That's the whole point of me going down this route. This is not a throwaway statement. This is not a casual statement. If somebody close to the Supreme Leader is making this statement, that means that the Supreme Leader has met with the religious leadership of Iran and considered the implications of that statement uh, because it has to square now with a new fatwa that will have to be issued at some point in time that says that other fatwa no longer is in existence. This is why we're doing what we're doing. I also think this, if you look at what has happened recently, the Russians, you know, they just basically said, if you threaten us, don't forget. We, we can stop. We can end this anytime we want to. We don't want to, but we will if we have to. And similar throughout this time, you know, and, and uh, recently I was reading where one of the politicians was asked in Russia, one of the top politicians was asked, you know, are you going to change your nuclear doctrine? And he said, it is what it is. You know, if I, if the existence of Russia is threatened and, and now think about this. If the existence of Russia is threatened, we reserve the right to use nuclear weapons. And the Iranians have said, if Israel 
threatens its existence, its existence. They use the exact same words. And I think there have been meetings there. You know, there's concern because Saudi Arabia has said, hey, if they won't get nukes, we want nukes. You know how that works. Other people in the neighborhood are going to say, hey, we want nukes too. And yeah. here's the thing. There are people in the neighborhood with enough money <laughs> to find a way to get their hands on nukes if they want to. I know that has to scare the bejesus out of the U.S. and out of a lot of people around the world. Um, and I think I understand where the Iranians are coming from. Your thoughts on that? Do you feel that they met with the Russians or the and or the Chinese or and or their BRICS allies? I do. But your thoughts on that and the fear that the West would have, the fear that even Israel and everybody would have would be other countries could get nukes. And and most of these countries, a lot of these Gulf countries have kind of Western puppet regimes, if we're honest, and the people are restive and unhappy and some of them could get over damn thrown. And then you got people who really don't like you, the U.S. and Israel with their hands on nukes. I would imagine this would be quite alarming on a number of uh, levels, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm just going to address, I, Garland, my wife tells me, never read the comments. But damn it. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> and there was somebody in there who said Pakistan has nuclear weapons and I'm full of, and then he used a nice little word. Um you do understand that Pakistan is a sovereign nation that isn't called Iran, that the Viliyat the Faqih is a, is a Shia religious doctrine unique to Iran, uh, that um, Pakistan uh, has more of a secular uh, government that doesn't tie Islamic interpretations into its national security policy. And so trying to bring Pakistan in here is an example to contradict what I said about Iran just yeah, underscores your ignorance, yeah. not mine. I'm fully capable of being ignorant, but on this case, I, I'd have to be dismissive of your contention that um, the fact that Pakistan has nuclear weapons is proof that everything I said about Iran is wrong. I've been studying Iran for a very long time. I've gone to Iran. I've met with Iranian leadership. I'm pretty comfortable with my uh, with my analysis. And, and you got to understand Pakistan. I mean, the current leader of Pakistan uh, came back to Pakistan from the suburbs of London after the U.S. <laughs> overthrew Imran Khan and put in a puppet. Go you, no, no, it's, we're not even, you know what I mean? You yeah. know, but anyway, go. No, 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 apparently, no, whoever no, that no. was didn't understand the dynamics even inside of Pakistan. The I don't believe that Iran would allow a critical domestic um, deliberation, such as, uh, especially one that's religious based, uh, to be influenced by either Russia or China. I think what would happen is that Iran would make this decision that it has this potential. Because why, believe me, why would you talk to the Russians about, um, you know, the possibility of an Iranian nuclear weapon if you have, if, if, you still, if your official policy is we don't want one, we, we religion uh, denies it. So I think they first have to cross the internal bridge right. saying that if the following conditions exist, we have no choice but to do this. And it's justified under Islam. Uh, because remember, this statement by the gentleman said, if decisions are made, it didn't say that we've already made the decision. It's if the decisions are made. You know, Iran is prepared to go this direction. So they aren't building a nuclear weapon as we speak. And I also want to point out uh, that he made to to build a nuclear weapon and more sophisticated nuclear designs, um, which backs what I've been saying is that the first Iranian nuclear weapon would be a gun design, uh, because that's something they could build literally in a week. Um, you know, and 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 they're going to have to act fast. They don't have time to build, test a uh, an implosion right. device because they'll be struck. So if they make this decision, it's a decision that can be implemented in a very short time. In a week, two weeks, they could have several nuclear uh, devices deliverable by ballistic missiles that have already been shown um, that, that, that can't be shot down. But this creates huge nonproliferation questions uh, for not just the United States, but Russia and China as well. And I do believe that once the decision's made, now they talk to the Russians and Chinese about you know, the direction they'll have to go if conditions thing. And just letting the Russian Chinese know, you know, maybe it's time we seek to make sure that conditions don't, you know, 
devolved to the point where Iran feels it has to build like Israel's nuclear program now needs to come on the table. This, I think, is actually the more likely um, motivation of Iran making such a declaratory policy. Uh, can so, I can I add, throw one more thing in there, Scott? And here's another thing that I picked up. They said, if Israel threatens our existence, Israel on a couple of occasions has said, once they even said, and I think this is important, the Israel, the Israel leadership once said, well, if the U.S. stops giving us bombs, then we'll have to use whatever weapons we have at our disposal. They have, on a couple of occasions, implied that they would use nuclear weapons against right. Iran. So when they say threatens our existence, I think they're saying to Israel, say it one more time. You, you said you said you'll nuke us. If we hear that again, you know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Because they're saying threatens our existence. If you say, well, we might have to nuke Iran in some way, shape, or form again, then we're going to have to act because you've already said it twice. Strike three. I, I yeah. feel like that's part of it. But if that's the case, then you don't even go to Russia and China. The reason why you go to Russia and China is you want them, I believe, to get the Israeli nuclear program on the table. Because this is the only, I mean, the only way you nip this thing in the bud is to take away Israel's nukes. Um, and the only way you take away Israel's nukes is to begin a dialogue um, about the danger posed by Israeli nuclear weapons. And so I think Iran has, I believe they've had their meeting. I believe that they, you know, they, they are ready with the fatwa. They haven't issued it yet, but that there is a fatwa that is written um, that can be released. And it would be released, I believe, internally first um because again if i'm an iranian nuclear scientist and i i live in the islamic republic i have to tell you if i'm holding a fatwa from ali khamenei saying nuclear weapons are haram you can't do it and suddenly i get a phone call from you know the president saying build nukes i'm going nope not gonna do it can't do it <laughs> religious edict right. i think what happens is knock on the door from the boys from uh, from the Supreme Leaders thing, open it in and say, this is a religious edict. It's top secret. If you talk about it, we execute you. Um, but as you understand, the, the, we have now, you know, the fatwa is that we will build nuclear weapons and you're going to, you have one week to get it done. Um, move. And then when the weapon's finished, that fatwa becomes public, becomes declaratory policy based on reality. That way you tell the, the Israelis, um, Yep, you nuke us, you die, and we have them. They're on the missiles. Right now, we're ready to rock. Um, now, the thing you tell the Russians is that's the scenario. If you don't want it, then help us make sure it doesn't happen, that we need your help diplomatically to neutralize the Israeli nuclear threat to Iran. Because if you don't, we have no choice but to go in this direction. Well, so, and, and so this, so, to some extent, the Russians and the Chinese who've been meeting with Fatah and different groups trying to organize some kind of a peace, in a way, in a, I guess, it gives them another weapon. You know what I mean? It gives them something else. Not saying that's the intent. I personally think that Iran does feel threatened by nuke by by Israel because Israel is threatening them with their nukes and, right. and, yeah. and and and. But I do think it also gives Iran and China something else to work with to say, look, we can resolve that. In order to do this, we're going to have to resolve this. This is a dangerous issue. In hindsight, perhaps Trump shouldn't have bought that out of that nuclear, the Iran nuclear deal after after all. But it is what it was. You you know what I mean? They that that opened the door for this. That opened the door for this when the U.S. arbitrarily backed out of the Iran nuclear deal. But that's a whole nother show. But at any rate, it does give people who are searching for peace or trying to coordinate something for peace another. I don't want to use the word weapon when I'm talking about peace, but another arrow in their quiver. How about we go with that uh, uh, metaphor? So I agree. I mean, first of all, this is the fact that we're talking about this should scare the living crap out of everybody. Um, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, you know, I, based upon the comments, I'm not supposed to read. Uh, there's just people that just don't take this thing seriously at all. That because we become sort of immune to it. Um, you know, nuclear weapons have existed for the totality of everybody here's life. Um, and they were told at one time that uh, there was disarmament, there was arms control. 
uh, that the nations believed that this wasn't going to happen. Um, you know, so this we're not worried about it. Nobody would be insane enough to use it, etc. Um, there are two things happening right now. There's there's this which <laughs> scares the crap out of me, to be honest, because you know nobody wants Iran to have nuclear weapons. That just it, not because you know they're Iranians and they can't have nuclear weapons. It's it is a dangerous escalation from a proliferation standpoint. Uh, even if Israel and Iran avoid nuclear conflict, Saudi Arabia isn't going to but let they're Iran. Gonna get them. They're going to get a nuclear Saudi's weapon. Get them, yeah. The United Arab Emirates will get one. I, you know, I was in the UAE um, in 2008 at a conference and uh, met with the the prince and uh, his advisors who were pursuing a UAE nuclear program and. You know, they had in place all these checks and balances. They were going to work with the safeguards, but you looked at it and those could be stripped away at any moment and the UAE would be left with a nuclear weapons capability. Um, and they aren't, you know, they they are the Sparta of the Middle East. Uh, you think Sparta is going to say we're not going to have the best weapon once the weapon becomes, uh, you know, in vogue. Um, and, and, the, and here's where you need American leadership. I mean, this is... Uh, we need to, you know, we could, we could stop this today. We could just go to the Israelis and say, guys, your, your nuclear program's on the table now. We're, we're done. Um, we have to look at a whole new uh, Middle East European, uh, Middle East security framework. Your weapons aren't part of it. They're destabilizing. Um, we can't have Iran building a nuclear weapon and we're not going to allow a situation where you feel you have the need to nuke Iran because then, you know, Pakistan may nuke you and then we're, you know, wham, we're in trouble. Um, so there's no American leadership here, none whatsoever. Hell, we can't stop the Israelis going into Rafah, um, although we could if we you know, picked up the phone and, and made it happen. I, I have to tell you right now, um, if I were the president of the United States, there'd be some burning Israeli tanks right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, just the way it is. I told you not to go on Rafah. What part of it? No, don't you understand? Take them out. Boom. Oh, you don't like that? I'll take out the Kira. I'll take out your residence. I'll take you off the face of the map. Uh, this is the United States of America you're talking to, but no, we're little wimpy America who, uh, you know, apparently, you know, we're the the mouse that roars and nobody listens to um, anymore. It, it's it's ridiculous. So this is a very dangerous situation. Then, of course, there's the Russia situation where Russia's literally doing the tests, the combat tests of the nuclear weapons they're going to use to eliminate the French military potential in Europe, the British military potential. And Putin, as Putin said today in his speech, um, oh, yeah, we have a strategic nuclear force is on standby right now to take out the world if you want to do that. We don't want to do it, but if you want to do it, we're ready to do that, too. Yeah, this is insanity, literal insanity. We've let, we've let Macron um, dictate our national um, existence by threatening to put troops into Ukraine, even though that can trigger a nuclear war. And we're letting Netanyahu uh, threaten our national existence by, you know, stupidly threatening Iran with nuclear weapons, knowing that the Iranians will make this transition. Um, and then we're hoping that, <laughs> and among all this insanity, we're hoping that rational thinking will prevail. <laughs>